Hi everyone, my name is Kuhelika Ghosh and I'm an English PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Today I will be presenting my paper titled Waste, Material Memory, and Diasporic Possibility in the Slave Fort. The space of the slave fort has been theorized as a contested space for Ghanaians and African Americans. While Ghanaians view the history of slavery through the lens of economic development, as heritage tourism offers commercial benefits for the state, African Americans turn to the slave fort as a site of memory, viewing themselves as returnees to an ancestral land. However, if we set aside the competing narratives within which the slave fort has been positioned and examined, the fort itself reveals its own memory of slavery through the material landscape it is embedded in and represents. My presentation will examine the landscape of the slave fort depicted in Sidia Hartman's memoir, Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route, and Emily Raboteau's Ghana section of her travel memoir, Searching for Zion, The Quest for Home in the African Diaspora. You can see the book covers of these two memoirs on the screen, Hartman's on the left featuring a photo of a slave dungeon and Raboteau's on the right. While these projects are interested in penning the material processes of return, there appears to be a tension between the desire for the diasporic elsewhere and the emptiness of the material environment of the slave fort that the writers are confronted with. By diasporic elsewhere, I refer to Nadia Ellis's understanding that diasporic consciousness is like a call from afar that the diasporic citizen keeps trying to answer. However, this desire remains unconsummated due to the lack of a material connection to the land. Hartman and Raboteau experience a similar diasporic pull toward the space of the slave fort where they might find memories of their ancestors. Yet the fort does not contain any personal belongings of the enslaved, but merely represents the site of death and suffering that the enslaved resided in. In light of the emptiness of this archive of slavery, the slave fort is a site of heritage tourism that is nevertheless deficient in its purpose of commemorating the dead. As diasporic subjects visiting the slave fort for the first time, Hartman and Raboteau encounter and inhabit the material landscape of the fort in different ways, whether through imagining the material conditions of the dungeon for enslaved women or by reflecting on history as waste, these affective experiences of material memory create a significant diasporic connection to ancestors, despite the emptiness of the fort. As a result, the material memories of enslaved ancestors in the form of waste and dirt still exist and speak from the gaps within the archive through the enmeshing of materiality and the bodily reactions of the writers themselves. By material landscape, I refer to the safe dungeon and the layers of waste and bodily remains etched onto the floor. The environmental features present in the dungeon as a result of these remains, as well as the space of the museum and the various artifacts that it includes and does not include. My presentation attempts to answer the following questions. Can inanimate forms such as waste and dirt speak? How do these material remainders of slavery form an alternative archive of sorts? How do these material memories connect with African-American returnees' desire for the diasporic elsewhere? While these slave forts have been read through the lens of heritage tourism, they are also part of an affective geography which the lens of post-colonial eco-criticism and dirt theory helps recuperate. On the top left of the screen is Elmina Castle, Cape Coast Castle on the top right, a photo of the male dungeon at Elmina Castle on the bottom left, and the female dungeon on the bottom right. I'll keep coming back to these photos through the course of the presentation. Scholars have engaged with the two memoirs mostly through the lens of memory as it relates to questions of diasporic identity and mobility in a transnational context. The figure of the slave fort reigns supreme in both narratives as a form of heritage tourism that is widely popular with African diasporic tourists, yet also has a complicated connection to the Ghanaian nation state. As you can see on the screen, I've included a screenshot of the TripAdvisor page for Elmina Castle, which lists the castle as the number one attraction in Elmina, Ghana. Drawing on Pierre Nora's theorization of Lou de Memoir or sites of memory, Elizabeth McGonigal says, Ghana slave forts are sites of memory that escape history by being frozen in the era of the transatlantic slave trade. 
However, Ghanaian and African diasporic people experienced different attachments to this history of slavery, leading to the forts becoming contested spaces with two categories of meaning. While African diasporic people examined the forts through the lens of the past, in the search for identity and spiritual homecoming, Ghanaians viewed the forts through a utilitarian desire to promote development. McGonagall adds, a sense of one collective memory from Africa and the diaspora is a fiction, but both Ghanaians and diasporan visitors cling to it for mutual benefit. Both parties have something to gain by promoting a sense of a cohesive community joined by a common African heritage. Similar to McGonagall, Sandra Richards views the slave forts as contact zones between visitors from different nations. Labeling the slave fort a geography of performance, Richards notes that the slave forts force the tourist to occupy the role of both spectator and actor, alternating between distance observation and imaginative self-identification. While the Ghanaian guide needs to perform a self-erasure and remember a history they learn to forget in order to attract tourists. In this process, both the tourist and the guide performatively depict a common African heritage, one that is forged from the state's promotion of heritage tourism. Hartman and Raboteau's visits to Elmina Castle reflect the gap between the diasporic dream and its material reality. As Hartman enters the slave fort, she expects to encounter some form of material remnant of the enslaved, but all she finds is emptiness and a complete absence of personal artifacts in the museum. Hartman notes that the museum houses a glass display case with items for which the enslaved had been traded, such as checkered cotton cloth, brass and iron bracelets, china, glass beads, red stones, umbrellas, guns, whiskey, mirrors, and chamber pots. The list of items ranging from household goods to more luxury items suggests a differential value for human life as well as the itemization of the enslaved as capital. Yet despite these markers of economic exchange, Hartman observes that her enslaved ancestors were missing in the museum. She adds, None of their belongings were arranged nicely in well-lit glass cases. None of their sayings were quoted on placards throughout the hall. The museum was as bereft as the underground. As Hartman lists out the artifacts and ways of life of the enslaved that are missing in the museum, there is an implicit comparison to the materials present in other museums. The anaphora none of suggests the inability of the museum to perform its purpose of commemorating the dead. Instead, the museum stands as an empty signifier for the lives lost through the slave trade, the only materials contained in it being items of exchange and pointing to the value ascribed to the goods that remain present in the museum while the enslaved and their artifacts are not. As you can see on the screen, the photos show that the museum includes information about the slave trade and pictures of the slave forts and shackles used on the slaves, but not much else besides that. Raboteau feels a similar sense of disappointment with the museum as Hartman does, emphasizing the absence of marks left by the enslaved. She compares the experience of walking through the slave fort to her visit to the Anne Frank house in Amsterdam with her mother, reflecting on the pencil marks on the yellowed wallpaper where Mrs. Frank had measured Anne's growth. She says, when we confronted the topmost line, the point where Anne's life was cut down, we inhaled as if history had punched us in the gut. It was easier to measure the loss of one girl's life than the lives of six million. Comparing the absent marks in the safe dungeon to the pencil marks in the Anne Frank house, Raboteau realizes that the loss of six million people remains an abstraction within the space of the slave fort. Elmina Castle as a space contains no markers of the slave's agency or even their presence, instead representing the enslaved as socially dead. She comments that the castle itself is the only structure left behind as a marker of this history of slavery, saying, The castle was cavernous, the lives it swallowed, digested, extreated, too staggering to fathom. As the castle swallows up the lives of the enslaved and any markers of them, it functions as a permanent graveyard of death and suffering. As a descendant of the enslaved, Hartman comments that her ancestors made it to the new world, yet her legacy starts with the graveyard, as she puts it, thus rereading the slave fort as a site of death. She wonders about her own purpose of visiting the slave fort, saying, Hovering in an empty room was my attempt to figure out how this underground had created and marked me.
I was loitering in a safe dungeon less because I hoped to discover what really happened here than because of what lived on from this history. Why else begin an autobiography in a graveyard? Hartman dwells on the significance of creation and marking within a landscape haunted by death and wonders about the notion of marks in multiple senses, the ways in which the slave fort has marked the enslaved, the slave's personal markers within the fort, and finally the fort's marks upon Hartman and her life as well. As you can see on the screen, the photo on the left is of the female dungeon at Elmina Castle with green algae on the walls and the one on the right shows the male dungeon at Cape Coast Castle which looks dark and empty. Even as Hartman and Raboteau grapple with the absence of the enslaved as subject within the archive of slavery, the landscape of the fort offers a possible avenue for locating the enslaved. A turn to the landscape offers a way to read the embedded histories of the enslaved which the written Eurocentric history of slavery may not highlight. Edouard Glissant emphasizes a turn to the landscape in the absence of local historiography, saying, Our landscape is its own monument. Its meaning can only be traced on the underside. It is all history. In the case of Hartman and Raboteau's projects, the absence of historical archives is a common obstacle for the two writers, and a turn to the landscape in these two texts can help negotiate the gaps of the archive, even as the landscape itself functions as a site of death. Postcolonial eco-criticism is a new and emerging field attempting to understand the histories of colonization in relation to the environmental landscape. Here on the screen, we have the book cover of Elizabeth Delofrey and George Handley's Postcolonial Ecologies monograph on the left and Kajetani Heka's Naturalizing Africa on the right. Drawing on W.J.T. Mitchell's notion of landscape as process rather than blank template, Delofrey and Hanley argue that histories embedded in the land and sea offer crucial methodologies to understand the impact of empire and the underlying anti-colonial epistemologies. The scholars suggest a foregrounding of landscape as a participant in colonialism's historical process rather than a bystander to human experience. A concern that comes up with regards to foregrounding landscape is the way colonial writings have associated the African continent with nature in a pre-modern sense in the past. Iheka points out that the project of colonial modernity sought to civilize Africans and their environment by distancing them from nature, and this distancing was carried into the practice of African literary studies and postcolonialism. Instead, Iheka aims to renaturalize Africa to examine Africa's complex ecologies, an approach that my presentation will also adopt for the purpose of reading the material history of slavery in Ghana slave forts. Both Hartman and Raboteau visit the dungeon at Elmina Castle and find themselves yearning to see or hear traces of the enslaved. As soon as Hartman steps into the dungeon, she reflects on the human waste permanently covering the dungeon floor that even archaeologists could not clear away. She says, I refused this knowledge. I came to this fort searching for ancestors, but in truth only base matter awaited me. The only part of my past I could put my hands on was the filth from which I recoiled, layers of organic material pressed hard against the stone floor. Hartman's search for her enslaved ancestors results in the material history of waste, which serves as a diasporic connection, yet also one that she does not invite. She blatantly indicates, I refuse this knowledge. Her refusal of this knowledge is a significant choice, since despite her refusal and affective recoil, she still stands on the remains of the enslaved, not necessarily in the way she desires, yet still a kind of material intimacy that is difficult to bypass. Hartman's refusal of this waste as history stems from her understanding that if ingestion exemplified the merchant's accumulation of capital and the slave's dispossession, then waste was a proof that the powerful had eaten, excrement was a material residue of this politics of the belly. However, this waste is not merely a signifier for capital, but also a significant part of the material history of the African landscape, creating an alternative archive of sorts in the absence of physical artifacts. Hartman's provocation that waste is outside history overlooks the presence of dirt as a material connection surrounding us on multiple scales. Heather Sullivan emphasizes that dirt makes up geological structures and the earth itself and is in fact mobile like our bodies. 
This emphasis on mobility makes dirt just as diasporic in its reach as Hartman herself. Further, drawing on feminist new materialist thinking, Sullivan proposes dirt theory as an antidote to nostalgic views, rendering nature a far away and clean side, precisely in order to suggest that there is no ultimate boundary between us and nature. We are enmeshed within dirt in its many forms. At the same time, Sullivan acknowledges the many definitions of dirt, from toxic grime to nurturing soil, and adds that dirt theory must attend to both positive and negative connotations of the term in cultural and scientific discourse. Reflecting on the maternal aspect of soil, Chris Mazur says that soil is the placenta that nurtures all of life, the membrane that unites the non-living components of the system with the living, the soil is the stage upon which the entire human drama is enacted. If soil is the motherly placenta connects the living and the non-living for Mazur, then this same maternal connotation can allow us to reconceptualize Hartman's experience in the dungeon as a space where the waste matter on the floor creates a diasporic link to the enslaved ancestors through an enmeshing of elemental materiality. Unlike Hartman's initial refusal of waste as history, Raboteau directly acknowledges the material history of the slave fort. When she enters the women's dungeon at Elmina Castle, Raboteau does not recoil from the realization that she is stepping on the organic waste and remains of enslaved bodies. Instead, she decides to dwell in this materiality and imagine the dungeon in the peak of its slave past. I wanted to feel angry too, but I felt nothing aside from dizziness, not even in the dank female dungeon which was humid and swarming with flies. The accretion of menstrual blood, excrement, urine, sweat, and tears combined over time into a carpet several inches thick upon the stone floor. I believed I could still smell it, the compacted issue of those women's bodies. I wanted to smell it. Something stank, but it may just have been the green beard of algae on the dungeon walls. Raboteau repeatedly emphasizes that even while she is experiencing history as waste, she is also affectively invested in the material experience of this connection. She claims, I wanted to feel angry and I wanted to smell it. However, these simultaneous affects of anger and desire are overshadowed by the bodily experience of inhabiting the dungeon. Raboteau feels dizzy due to the environmental elements in the dungeon, such as the humidity, flies, and green algae on the walls that physically affect her body. Unlike Hartman's insistence on looking for something other than the knowledge of death within the space, Raboteau draws on Hartman's experiences and pushes them forward, saying, I believed I could still smell it, the compacted issue of those women's bodies. However, she adds that she's not quite sure if the smell is emanating from the algae on the walls or the remainders of bodies. As the deaths of the slave past merge with the present-day landscape of the fort, a diasporic connection is formed through the transformation of waste and rot into the algae on the walls. Further, this merging of material past and present forces Raboteau to feel the presence of enslaved ancestors through her bodily reactions, creating a material diasporic connection. Drawing on Jose Esteban Munoz's queer utopian horizons, Nadia Ellis reconceives diasporic consciousness as the urgent sensation of a pull from elsewhere when not fulfilled. As memory takes on a material form for Raboteau's experience in the safe dungeon, diasporic consciousness becomes equally material as it is rendered through felt experience as a horizon of possibility. While Raboteau searches for a sense of diasporic connection in the present within the slave fort, Hartman's quest has more to do with paying tribute to ancestors and the process of remembering one's kin. However, she adds, but five minutes in the underground dashed these grand aspirations. The stark facts won out. It was a hold for human cargo, and knowing what happened here couldn't remedy oblivion or betoken a brighter future or lessen the suffering of the dead. While Raboteau dwells in the materiality of waste in the dungeons in order to experience a sense of diasporic connection, however fleeting it may be, Hartman refuses to see the space of the dungeon as anything other than an empty hold. For Hartman, remembrance must inevitably include situating the enslaved as subject within the narrative rather than mere object. Despite her reservations, Hartman finds herself coming back to the dungeon over and again in an attempt to search for something that remains of the enslaved other than waste and dirt. She says of her following visits to the dungeon, 
I knew only how it felt, which was akin to choking. My chest grew congested and my palms started sweating and I got lightheaded. My skin became tight and prickly as if there was too little of it and too much of everything else. I could feel my torso bulge and distend like a corpse swelling with gases. Hartman's experience of revisiting the dungeon highlights the incompleteness of the search for diasporic connection for both writers. Yet despite the emptiness of the archive and Hartman's unwillingness to acknowledge waste as history, she admits that the dungeon offers a space for a kind of negative affect. She highlights that the physical sensation of choking and dizziness ultimately led to feeling like a corpse within the suffocating space of the dungeon. Like Rabotou's experience of dizziness in the dungeon, Hartman too grapples with the physical experience of being in the hold. Yet, the physical sensations overpower her to the extent that she feels like a corpse inhabiting a similar temporal and spatial dimension as the enslaved ancestors themselves. In this moment, the analogy of the corpse suggests that Hartman feels a kind of diasporic connection to the enslaved, although not in the positive way she had hoped. Despite this bodily reaction to the safe hold, Hartman denies any form of diasporic connection. She says, each time it was the same, I failed to discover anything. Hartman refuses to find connection in the space of the dungeon, yet her bodily sensations indicate a certain physical connection to the enslaved's own temporality that is difficult to dispute. As she walks inside the dungeon and runs her fingers down the walls, she adds, what I wanted was to feel something other than bricks and lime. What I wanted was to reach through time and touch the prisoners. Nothing had endured except blood, shit, and dirt. Hartman desires to breach the temporal boundary and connect with her unsaved ancestors physically. Yet despite Hartman's rejection of material memory in the form of brick, blood, waste, and dirt, her own bodily reactions betray her as she claims, my skin became tight and prickly, as if there was too little of it and too much of everything else. The waste and dirt fill in for the emptiness of the dungeon, and these material remainders become the too much of everything else that Hartman is physically affected by. Hartman's failure to discover anything might be read as a refusal to read the material elements of the saved fort landscape as standing in for the unsaved. Yet despite this refusal, Hartman's bodily reactions serve as evidence of a diasporic connection to enslaved ancestors through this material memory. Hartman's physical experiences resituate the enslaved as subject within the landscape of the fort and also suggest a material and maternal connection across time that the history of slavery cannot erase. Hartman and Raboteau arrive in Ghana with different goals. While Hartman is interested in the project of retracing the slave route, Raboteau is engaged in a quest for Zion within the African diaspora. However, both their projects intertwine in the space of the fort as both writers grapple with the material elements of the fort landscape and their bodily reactions to these remainders of slavery. Examining the material elements of the fort, such as waste, dirt, and artifacts in the museum, allows us to see the inner connections between the material memory of slavery and the diasporic elsewhere. On the screen is a map of the African diaspora and the connections between different places. Reading the material landscape of the slave fort deepens the intersection of post-colonial and environmental studies, allowing us to consider the enslaved as subject through the possible diasporic connections that engaging with elemental materiality allows. The slave fort moves beyond being merely a sign of the Ghanaian nation-state's project of heritage tourism, but begins to serve as a space for possible diasporic connection. Thank you.